I'm Joan Herman, and this is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Thanks for joining me today. Our guest today is Rushworth Kidder. Rush is the founder and president of the Institute for Global Ethics and is a former columnist and senior editor for the Christian Science Monitor. Rush is the author of nine books, including Moral Courage and How People Make Tough Choices. His new book is called Good Kids, Tough Choices, How Parents Can Help Their Children Do the Right Thing. Hi, Rush. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Joan. Rush, your new book is talking about raising kids ethically and morally, and in today's society, anyone who has children knows that that is quite a difficult task. But before we get into that, I'd I'd just like to get a little bit of background. How did you get interested in this type of work, and why do you feel compelled to follow this path? Well, I really got into it when we were working with the Christian Science Monitor and did a major series, this was back in the mid-'80s, asking people what they thought were the big issues that were going to face us in the 21st century. And of the six things that we identified over a year of interviewing around the world. The others included things like the nuclear threat and environmental degradation and all of that. Of those things, one of them was ethics. And that was fascinating. That was before there was an ethics column in the New York Times. That was before the big interest in in ethics came along. But it was clear to us that that was going to be one of the big topics. And I just began following it then. And it has since become a compelling activity for me. I, I really think this is going to be the key to moving us out of so many of the issues that we're struggling with right now. What does ethical mean? <laughs> Typically, I think of ethics as the application of our values to our decision making. I mean, if, if there's no decisions made, if nobody takes any action or thinks about things, there, there's no ethics done. And people can make decisions based on lots of different things. When they're really taking their core values into context, when they're thinking about this decision in the in, the, in connection with honesty, uh, responsibility, respect, and so forth, that's when you're really getting into what ethics is all about. And how does ethics tie in with morality? You know, they're, they're really, in the, in, the, in the work of many philosophers, contemporary philosophers these days, they're, they're pretty much synonymous. Uh, I, w- I would urge people not to make, try to make huge distinctions around something where there isn't a, a big difference. Now, for many people, however, morality is the, the idea of the difference between right and wrong, and ethics is the conversation about that idea or the study of that idea. So, for example, you wouldn't talk about going to a business school and taking a course in business morals. That would surprise people. But business ethics makes perfect sense because it's the application of these distinctions between right and wrong. In your book, Good Kids, Tough Choices, you focus on what you call three lenses for ethical parenting. What are these three lenses? The lenses really, uh, they're sort of developmental. The first one, you're working with the youngest kids, is what we simply describe as knowing what's right. And that has to do with our core values. The work that we've done at the Institute for Global Ethics over the last 20 years, and for which we're perhaps best known, is our work in a number of different countries around the world, identifying what people think of as their most important important ethical values. And what we're finding so far uh, is that everywhere we ask about values, we hear the same thing. In every demographic, we hear the same thing. Across the genders, we hear the same thing. It doesn't matter whether people are religious or not religious, we hear the same thing. Let me tell you what we find. Five core values. They won't strike you as odd when I tell you what they are. This isn't rocket science. But everywhere you ask people about ethics, they say, look, honesty matters. They say respect matters. They say responsibility matters. They say fairness matters. And they say compassion matters matters. They may use different words. They may not talk about honesty. They may talk about truth or openness or transparency, if you see what I mean. But the whole point is there aren't a lot of differences out there. It's not true that everybody has a different set of values. In fact, there is remarkable unanimity around these things. That's the first of these lenses that we're, that we're talking about. And that's how you talk to little kids. You know, you, you, when, when the child is three or four, you're trying to inculcate these simple ideas about, look, you must be honest. You need to be respectful. You have to be responsible. Fairness is really important. And, of course, you've got to love the cat and not pull its tail. So we're, we're, we're doing that to start. You move into the second lens, which is all about making tough choices. And that's what happens when two of your core values come into conflict one with another. That's what happens when your kid comes home from school, your daughter comes home from school almost you know, teary-eyed, saying that her best friend just told her that she has a that the friend has a serious eating disorder and swore her to secrecy made her promise never to tell a soul and suddenly at the end of the afternoon the principal walks up to her and says i've noticed your friend is struggling you know i think she may be in danger of of being really ill can can you tell me what's going on there you are with responsibility pulling you one direction. You mm-hmm. promise to keep your word, and that's a really important thing to honor. And truth-telling pulling you the other direction, where if you don't speak up, your friend may die. For that child, there's no wrongdoing. This is not a story of ethics as right versus wrong. Nobody's done anything wrong here. 
but it's a tough moral dilemma about right versus right. And that's a key part of what this book is focusing on. How do you talk about these right versus right questions? And then just quickly, the third of these lenses, uh, which really has to do with, as, as we describe it, standing for conscience, or in other words, having the moral courage, once you've made the decision to do what the decision tells you to do, this is tough for your teenager who goes back into the school and has to sit down with her friend. She has to have the guts to do this, sit down with a friend and say, look, I know you swore me to secrecy, but I'm really, really worried, and we've got to find a way to get some help for you. Would you agree to talk with the principal with me or, you know, something like that? And the friend may say, you promised I'll, I'll never talk to you again. And that's okay. I mean, that's, that's the courage that's required. You've got to have the courage as a teenager to say to your friend, look, I'd rather have you alive and hating me than dead just because I didn't speak up. That's tough stuff. As parents, what is the right time to begin ethical parenting, and how can we open the dialogue about ethics with our children? Well, you know, some, quite often they open uh, themselves by simply by their, their actions. Uh, you're starting at a very young age. The, the research out there suggests that you're, you're easily starting at ages two and three and, and perhaps beyond that in finding kids doing things that aren't quite right and correcting them. At that point, you're saying, no, that's wrong, and this is the right thing to do. You're doing it gently. You're not using it as a big stick. You're not doing it confrontationally. You're just urging them into, you know, how to, how to, to, to do the right thing. I remember when our daughter was three years old, we caught her in the closet one day eating toothpaste from her sister's <laughs> toothpaste tube. You know, and when we said, have you, I mean, there was toothpaste smeared all over her face. <laughs> and when we said, have you been eating toothpaste? She looked right at us and said, no. <laughs> you know, well, how do you how do you work that one through? My the son did things. that. <laughs> he ate Is toothpaste right? too. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, that's, that o- over to you. How did you handle it? You, you didn't hit him with a big stick, clearly. <laughs> no. No. You, you, you talk it through with them, and and here you've got two things to say. Look, one is honesty. You know, please, you know, tell tell me the truth now, because I can see that there's toothpaste scattered around here. Uh, you 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 don't want mommy to lie to you. You don't mom, want mommy to say I'm home when in fact I'm not going to be home, and I don't want you to lie to me. And the second point is respect. You know, don't go into your sister's room and take things that aren't yours. How would you feel if somebody took your favorite? You know, etc. All right. of these kinds of conversations are building the respect for these core values, and you can do that at a very early age. You know, one of the things that I found very interesting in your book was when you were talking about lying with children. That prior to age three, children tell the truth and. And by age eight, they're fully skilled liars. What do you mean when you talk about a fully skilled liar? And how do these children acquire this skill? Isn't that a scary phrase? Mm. Uh, that, that's a phrase out of, out of the research that's been done on, on all of this. The, the notion that, that they, they become fully skilled lie tellers. What, what they learn to do is not only to not indicate that they've deceived you, but to not give any, indica- any, 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 any hints that would allow you to figure out that they've deceived you. They're covering their tracks, in other words. They, they sort of learn how to, how to do that as they, as they go. And what you're, what you're constantly doing there, it seems to me, is working with them not only verbally, but especially by your example. I guess over the years of doing the interviews for this book, I've come to conclude that good ethical parenting is 90% example and 10% talk. You, you, there, there has to be that 10%. There has to be those points where you really focus on the idea and say, here's why I'm taking this stand. Here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Explain your own ethical decision-making as you go. But so much of it is just setting the, setting the standard. And you know, the standard that you set, can it, it can surprise you in, in so many ways, and, and you have to be aware of the fact that they're always, they're always watching. What do you do when you show up at the movie theater and you've got a small framed 13-year-old who looks like he could be 11, and it says tickets 12 or under are half price. Now, there are some parents, this, this is a question that we often use in our workshops, and it splits audiences right down the middle. Half of them say, look, that's not a law, for goodness sakes. That's just some theater saying, saying what they want to say. You know, I see nothing wrong with saving the family's money. And there are others who would say, what are you talking about? Look at the example you're setting for your child. He's standing right there watching you lie to somebody else about a question of rules. Right. <laughs> so these are the ways in which you're, you're constantly, as a parent, needing to be alert to what it is you yourself are doing. It's all little things that we as parents can do that we don't even realize the impact that we have on our children. Exactly right. And, and we don't, you know, you know we're, we're always creating narratives. We're always telling stories by our action. And sometimes 
that story won't be told for 30 years. Uh, and I've had a number of situations like that. Of I remember a, a woman telling me a story of being just, at, at eight years old, being just deeply embarrassed by her mother, who was so outraged by the treatment that she'd gotten at some store downtown by you know, a clerk who just sort of blew her off, that she went back and stood out in front of that store for a while and said to people who were about to come in, you may not want to shop here because they really don't have a very good attitude. You know, and he dragged the daughter along with her. And the daughter said, I was just mortified. Mm -hmm. But now looking back on it, that's a story for her of her mother's moral courage. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're creating these narratives as we go. And, and that's how we're training our kids in many ways. Rush, one of the things that I really would like to know is, why do you think parents are so uncertain about how to guide their children through ethical dilemmas? Well, you know, I think parents are spooked in a, in a number of ways. They, they and, and, and legitimately so. They, uh, part of it is that for many parents, and for many of us, actually, uh, we grew up with a kind of a, a slightly indifferent moral compass, and I think reflecting back on it, some of us were embarrassed about the things we did in high school and college and all of that that, that we wouldn't we wouldn't do now. Uh, and I think some parents say, "Look, uh, what I don't have any moral standing uh, to to rebuke my child because look what I was doing at, at at that age." But in fact, parenting is an absolutely transformative experience, uh, morally and ethically, for most people. They, they suddenly, when they have the responsibility for this new being they've brought into the world, they, they shed some of that silly stuff that they were going through. They understand that it's there, and they, they understand their child might get through it, go through it themselves. But they begin to have a different take on it. But, you know, what I think is really bothering parents so much these days is just the, the skills at communication. They don't quite know how to get the conversation going. They don't want to sound preachy. They don't want to sound naive and irrelevant. They don't want to sound as though they think that ethics is all about turning the clock back, and if only you would behave the way my parents made me behave, everything would be fine. They, they know they need a more robust and thoughtful language, and they're, they're, they're groping for that. And part of what this book is all about is just uh, pathways, techniques, ways to open the conversation, ways to mm -hmm. get parents engaged in what, when they, when they do it right and it's not confrontational, becomes one of the most interesting conversations you can have with your kids. Put a tough right versus right dilemma on the table in front of kids about the environment, about something going on in society, about something like sexting or, you know, using cell phones and, and all of that. Kids will devour that. They'll understand both sides of the argument, and they'll, they'll keep talking about it after you've, you've uh, gone to bed. Uh, so it, it can be wonderful stuff, but parents need ways to get into the conversation. Which parenting style do you think best promotes moral development? You know, there's been a lot of research on that. Uh, the, the, the standard body of research is distinguishing between permissive parenting, we've all heard that word, uh, and authoritarian parenting. You know, there's the sort of my way or the highway parenting, and then there's the sort of let it all hang out and, and uh, whatever kind of parenting on, on the other side. In fact, that's, that research is, has been going on for about 40 years, and there's enough evidence now that has accumulated to suggest that the ideal is, is neither one of those. There's a, there's a moderate ground in the middle, which is clearly very authoritative. Uh, you, parents understand exactly what they, what they think and, and, and how they want to move forward, but it is also listening. It's responsive. Uh, the, the authoritarian is simply making lots of demands and not asking, not, not being very responsive. Which is what we were all raised with. <laughs> In a sense, yeah. yeah. The permissive style is all responsive right. and not very demanding. No particular demands on the child. It turns out that if you measure it in, in, by lots of different measures, in terms of grade point average, in terms of how kids succeed and all of that, the best style is, is the one that is both makes demands, but is also very responsive and very, very listening. That's, that's what we really need to cultivate. You no, know, Russ, those are wonderful words with great wisdom, and I hope that people will listen to what you're saying. We all do need to work together to impact our children, to make some strides in our society today for a number of reasons, a number of obvious reasons. Our guest today is Rushwood Kidder. Rush, the founder and president of the Institute for Global Ethics and a former columnist and senior editor for the Christian Science Monitor. Rush is the author of nine books, including Moral Courage and How Good People Make Tough Choices. His new book is called Good Kids, Tough Choices, how parents can help their children do the right thing. And I highly recommend this book for anyone trying to raise a child in today's society. Rush, thank you so much for spending time with us today, and I hope we have the opportunity to talk to you again. Thanks, Joan. Look forward to that. I'm Joan Herman, and this is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Thanks for tuning in.